Good morning to everybody who's joined. Thank you for joining the, the uh, webinar today. I'll just deal with some housekeeping items first and then do the introductions. Uh, th there will be time for questions at the end of the webinar. Uh, we're planning a 30 minute total session with a 20 minutes for the presentation and 10 minutes afterwards. Um, if anybody has any questions, uh, please go to the go to webinar control panel during the presentation and type them in um, and then at the end they will be read out by the WSP organizer for the webinar. Uh, the presentation is available um, in the handouts box uh, again in the go to webinar platform. I see the numbers are climbing, but I will, I will make a start now so that we can try to keep to schedule. Well, th thank you to, to those that have joined. Um, this is a Snack and Learn webinar hosted by WSP. Um, <clears throat> on the title of Hydropower Tunneling and Geotechnical Risk Mitigation, and it's from the perspective of the lender's technical adv advisor. I'm calling from WSP in Sydney, Australia, and WSP acknowledges that every project we work on takes place on First Peoples lands. We recognise the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as being the first scientists and engineers, and we pay our respects to the elders past and present. Um, in my case from Sydney, Australia, I'm here um, on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. So a little bit about myself, uh, I'm a technical director for hydropower and tunnels. Uh, I've been at WSP for 19 years in total, that's um, mostly in Sydney, 17 years, but a couple of years um, over in New York. Uh, I started my tunneling career on the English side of the Channel Tunnel back in 1988. Um, great fun those days, rotating 14 days on and seven days off, working some 12 hour shifts, uh, but really whetted my appetite for tunneling. Um, uh, industry. Um, but after that, I've been around the pumped hydro and hydropower industry since 1990, uh, mostly, uh, well, obviously now in Australia, but Africa and Asia, and I've found it a fascinating and rewarding industry. So again, thank you for joining. Um, I'd like to talk through these main content topics today. Uh, number one, the lender's technical advisor for pumped hydro and hydropower, and we'll, we'll explain what that role and responsibilities really means. Um, item two on the geotechnical risk management, which of course in itself is a very wide topic. Um, ESG, the environmental, social and governance implications for hydropower, that, that's very important. Um, climate change is a theme, um, obviously it's one of the, it's number 13 there, you can see in the 17 sustainable development goals of the, of the UN. Um, so I've chosen a um, topic there to talk about how hydropower uh, often needs to deal with deal with the flood of record. And then on number five, um, this is for the perspective of the lenders. So what worries the lenders in, in such projects? <clears throat> now the webinar does cover the role of the uh, lenders technical advisor for Hydro, but the role can also be termed <clears throat> lenders independent consultant, lenders engineer, independent certifier, different terminology in different jurisdictions. But principally the role includes identifying and mitigating the underground or tunnel risks on behalf of the lenders before they're about to uh, loan their monies to the project. And the typical services for the LTA on behalf of the lenders extend across four key phases of the involvement of the financiers. That starts with the due diligence phase. Uh, there's then, we then go into the pre-financial close phase, sometimes called the bankable phase. Um, <clears throat> Uh, then there's the construction financing, of course, that, that's the main three, four or five years of construction of a large hydro scheme, and then it continues throughout the operations. Let's take an example here. We have a uh, large pumped storage hydro project. Uh, it, it might require a 750, meet deep, a 750 meter deep pressure shaft. Um, from the top of that mountain there to a point um, down where an underground cavern could be located to house the turbines and generators and transformers and other equipment. Um, to do that, you would need, to, or to properly assess that hole, you would need an 800 meter deep borehole or, or thereabouts, <clears throat> plus several other very deep boreholes to intersect tunnels. So it poses a question, should we drill this hole at the feasibility stage? Well, the answer is abs absolutely yes. Uh, I think most um, stakeholders would say yes, but I'm putting the hat on now from, from the perspective of the lenders. Uh, yes, I mean, how, how really could you, um, plan to proceed with a project with, with potential high risk without 
<clears throat> without knowing what lies beneath, particularly in the vicinity of, of, of the deep shaft. So how much investigation is enough? Excuse me, I'll just take a drink. <clears throat> well, there's no perfect answer, uh, but bearing in mind that the lenders become involved in a project only after the feasibility study has passed its, its gate and it's moving forwards. So the lenders and their advisors have very little influence on what might have taken place in the feasibility study. Now, the lenders want assurance that the borrower, i.e. the owner of the project, has invested enough into the investigations. Uh, hydropower underground risk is very different to urban tunneling risk, you know, for a metro or motorway tunnel, um, really due to its remoteness uh, and the typical depths that you need to drill to get down to the tunnels. Um, and of course, there is no bonus neighboring project data from existing buildings or deep foundations that may exist in, in most cities. Uh, to gain access for the investigations is very difficult and costly, and sometimes they're under national parks where it's simply not environmentally acceptable to drive along the surface to get to the point above where you may wish to drill down. Um, feasibility investigations are therefore very speculative on the alignments and the abandonment the abandonment of some holes due to um, getting back the data and deciding that it's not an appropriate alignment is quite real and so they therefore become quite costly. Uh, and in order to achieve the credit approval for, for the lenders at the, at the financial close stage, they really do need multiple checks and balances and it all comes down to, well, it largely comes down to geotechnical risk management. Now, it's interesting that the ITA, the International Tunneling Association in their working group too, um, back in 2015, assessed some case histories of site investigations for some tunnels in the UK, um, and invested and found that um, invested uh, projects invested generally less than 3% of the construction cost, but sometimes exceptionally went down as low as 0.5%. But they then went on to say that it suggests investing less than 1% of the total project cost in site investigations is generally considered to be risky. Um, Hydropower, pumped hydro, uh, the, 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 the range of projects is very wide. It can be large, small, high head, low head, um, and therefore a lot of flow or small flow. Um, in the case of small hydropower schemes, um, generally there's a, lot of, there's a lot more surface works than underground tunneling works. However, those surface, those surface works um, can pose very serious geotechnical challenges. And just some examples here, you know, if you have a low pressure um, system that you need to get um, for a hydropower scheme, it could be the waterway could be delivered through a tunnel, uh, through an uh, open channel, or, 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 or through low pressure pipelines, or through high pressure penstocks. Um, so really, the, the, the risk is, is, is there to be seen. It, um, it, each project has its own individual risks. Um, <clears throat> but um, it, 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 it certainly should not be ignored if just by going on the surface. But if it, but turning now to the underground works for pumped hydro and hydropower, now a, a significant portion of the risks for the project as a whole is in lies in the tunneling and underground works. And fairly obviously, it's mainly due to the uncertain ground conditions. And because it's far more costly, difficult, time consuming, as I mentioned before, to obtain the same level of geotechnical exploration for the very deep and remote hydropower project tunnels uh, than uh, compared to what you would normally be able to obtain in, in a city where the tunnels for, say, a metro tunnel um, or a motorway tunnel would be much, much shallower, you know, 30, 40, 50 metres deep, as opposed to many hundreds of metres deep in a, in a large scale remote um, hydropower project. So um, it, 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 it's not unusual for the remote hydro tunnels to have, say, less than 5% of the frequency of the drilled boreholes and targeted relevant data that you might find or that you might be able to obtain and afford and be able to afford to obtain in the equivalently priced urban transportation project. I've made a couple of references there. I was fortunate enough to provide a couple of technical papers, uh, one last year in Sydney. Uh, it, was, it, was a, it was a paper into much more details on the theme of today's webinar, but really about the ge geotechnical risk. Uh, that was at the conference on soil mechanics and geotechnical engineering. And then just last month, where I had a paper where, where comparing the issues, the, the risks and the levels of the geotechnical investigation for the remote hydro tunnels compared with the urban transportation tunnels. And that's where that value of less than 5% frequency came from. And that was presented just last month um, at the World Tunneling Congress in, in Athens. 
Now, um, some, some hydropower underground features um, that WSP has experienced in our, in our wide ranging experience on different types of hydro projects. Typically, you're going to deal with tunnels, shafts, and caverns. Uh, tunnel boring machines, TBMs, uh, they are generally used for the long tunnels and, and we find them mostly in hard rock conditions for hydropower, given the generally mountainous re regions that, that most of the large hydros exist in. But of course, there's also the drill and blast um, in, in a significant amount of drill and blast tunneling due to the um, uh, geometries and the shapes and the tight curves required for, for many of the waterways and access tunnels and soft ground techniques. Some other features of underground works for hydropower schemes which, which really differ from the urban transportation tunnels are some very deep and significant um, surge and pressure shaft. They can be vertical or inclined and they can be many hundreds of meters depth. Uh, desilting chambers are large chambers required underground, often in multiple arrays, um, to ensure that sands and sediments are trapped and removed from the waterway system so that they don't flow towards the uh, turbine and the generating equipment. Uh, the, view, the view there of caverns just shows the complexity typically of a large um, underground Power, power station housed within caverns for, for hydropower, uh, a multitude of waterway tunnels, access tunnels, ventilation, caverns and, and interconnectors, very, very complex and usually at great depth below this ground surface. Uh, and then there are steel linings, uh, continuously welded, you know, continuous steel linings over the stretch of tunnel that's assessed to uh, uh, require it due to the uh, internal water pressures. Um, so again, there's some, there's some significant um, features of the underground works that, uh, uh, that, that all, all bring various um, degrees of risk. This um, project life cycle versus risk rating curve that um, has, has been developed in the blue line there um, is, is, is indicative really. It's a, it's a blend that I've put together of the lender's risk exposure um, at, at any point in time. Um, it, it's a blend because it make, you know, the different types of risk exposure could cover the financing risks, the technical risks, the commissioning challenges as you get to the um, um, commercial operation date. Uh, there could be teething problems with the equipment or the civil works. Uh, and then there are stakeholders issues which ebb and flow throughout the project, public perception and reputation. If you put all of that together, it's a generic curve of how that risk rating may change over the five key phases that I've shown here. There's the development phase, the bankability phase, construction phase, defects liability, which is normally about two years, and then the operational phase. Um, now, it, it, just to talk through some of those key phases, um, and you can see how the, um, the risk trend will evolve, it will gradually climb as the lender gets more involved, and it's really at the financial close or, or the end of the bankability phase, um, where the um, real monetary exposure comes in, because that's when the that's, that's when the um, loan starts to be drawn down and used for construction. Um, the, the yellow circles in the lower left, um, just some terminology there, um, in the development phase and spilling into the bankability phase are the pre-feasibility, FS, and then the full feasibility, FS, and the feed, front end engineering design. Um, different terminologies or concept design is sometimes used, but the point is they're all early development phase um, and then they, as, I, as I've shown, they spill into the bankability phase. And then the LTA, the Lenders Technical Advisor, would, um, if it's debt funded, of course, um, the, the project, would undertake the due, di due diligence. Um, so it's very important that the owner or the potential borrower has uh, anticipated the requirements of the lender and try to in, you know, include as much of that as they can in those earlier studies so that there are no surprises or, and that and that the project owner is aware of what requirements the lender will need in order to achieve financial close. Uh, the bankability phase, um, it, 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 it's rather elastic, it seems, in, on, on many projects. Um, it, it, you know, it, it can extend significantly, significantly, particularly on the environmental and social aspects, if the borrower has not um, invested enough in the feasibility stage, and we have to go back and do and, and do more baseline work. Um, it's interesting that in that green ellipse I've shown on the left, multiple pumped, hour, pumped hydro energy systems projects in Australia are currently in this phase. Um, hopefully many more will come 
um, through the bankability phase and start construction. Now, uh, th th that risk evolution that I mentioned, of course, the um, problems do, can potentially um, continue into the operational phase. I mean, in, in hydropower, um, unlike uh, transportation tunnels, where as soon as they're built, the, pretty much the load is coming onto the uh, onto the tunnel, the major loads and forces that many of the waterways are designed for only get applied when those waterways get filled. So once it's watered up and the stru structures are subject to the surge in the transient pressures, and that's you know at the end of the project. Um, an example here: it's a relatively small scale project but a boulder fall punched a hole in the channel roof so you know um, rock fall was anticipated but it was under designed um, it was inadequate it blocked the flow that was flowing through that concrete channel uh, and it caused a spill so the middle photograph is is taken from the same position but looking upstream so where where there was no roof it had spilled out and started to undermine the channel upstream um, it, you know the the geote geotechnical challenges to remain not only through construction but in, into operations as well and it's at, and of course at, at that point in time the lenders are very um, uh, protective of their project that they have the loaned the money to because they need the revenues to, they need the borrower to remain financially healthy to to repay their loan um, some some challenges um, in remote terrain it can be large-scale surface instability as as on the left example Actually, in that particular example, it was the surface um, um, area which was particularly unstable, but underlying the slope, it was it basically quite stable. Uh, but, and then there were small scale instabilities as, as shown in the central picture in the top. Uh, a bit of everything on the top right where we have tight, tight hairpin bends um, need to be assessed for delivery of large turbines and equipment, uh, dealing with the river interface down at the access roads and general slope, slope stability. Uh, the, the, the large picture in the bottom uh, middle shows some intensive boulder deposition following the flood of record. Uh, before the flood of record, which came through, and it was assessed to be significantly more than 50 years, probably much more than 100 years, uh, there, were, there were very, very few boulders at all in that river. That changed things completely. It poses, it poses the question, is it a geotechnical or hydrological problem? Um, just coming back to some of those solutions for the small scale hydro, um, the, um, it, it, it needs to be cost effective. Um, we, we, we found that the use of rock fill gabions used where possible as an alternative to tensioned elements such as or, 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 or relatively high tech such as shot grid and rock bolts is, is much preferred for slope stabilization. It's simple, effective, deformable, very deformable in fact, and of course replaceable in future years, um, and it's very much lo low technology. So what are some lenders' le le key concerns? Now, this is a very wide topic in, in general, um, but reputational damage, the ENS, the environmental and social issues, or how it may affect the project of affected persons and their livelihood impact and resettlement, all of those collective ENS, ESG issues are very important to the lenders. Um, and also the issues which may af adversely affect the borrower or the owner's ability to repay the loan, hence the lenders need to do uh, in-depth due diligence into the hydrology, because that's the fuel which will uh, which will allow, allow the hydro scheme to generate the money. The contract provisions and the liquidated damages, that's the L LDs, they need to be assured that the borrower um, is, 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 is protected somewhat through, through the contracts. Um, and of course, the program and price, uh, when does the revenue stream start? Just to explain some of the LTA um, positions, um, WSP here, we work um, um, on a significant number of projects in both the LTA role and the OE role. OE is owner's engineer. Really, ju just to differentiate the two, the LTA's duty of care is to the lenders, um, and the LTA is employed to ensure that the borrower delivers on the obligations to the lenders, whereas the owner's engineer's duty of care is to the borrower or the owner. I, I use the term borrower because that's the context of the uh, uh, lender's advisor. Um, and the OE is employed to ensure that the contractors deliver on the obligations to the owner. But the LTA services are normally paid for by the borrower. Um, and it's th th there are closely aligned, aligned objective for both the lenders and the borrower. Uh, they both want a safe project to be completed on time and to have satisfactory financial returns. Um, but it's important to note that the 
the project as a whole and the lender's reputations are hard earned but easily eroded or lost. So it brings us to the whole topic of the um, environmental, social and governance of, of hydropower and pumped hydro projects. Um, and if you take an example of the environmental considerations of tunnel spoil, haulage of the spoil, tunnel water handling, etc., it has potentially quite um, large um, environmental impacts. So the, the RTA has an important role to safeguard the lender's reputation in, in regard to all of those topics. Um, the, the LTA's role uh, is often split sort of 60-40 to the technical aspects and 40% to the ENS aspects, which recognises and acknowledges the lender's importance of those ESG aspects um, when they're lending money to a project. So in summary, um, the lender's risk exposure or the mitigation of that is about all of these things. It's balancing risk, it's environment, it's the time schedule, it's the social aspects, it's the financing aspects, hydrology or the fuel, it's the geotechnical or technical aspects, and the contracting, and many more. So to achieve credit approval, uh, it's no wonder that uh, the lenders start with reviewing the feasibility study, but will have significantly more input um, based on the, the, the LTA's due diligence. So to, to summarise, the LTA, uh, we're typically an independent consultant, but work for two clients. We would take instructions from the lenders, but our paymaster would be the borrower or the owner. Uh, and, and I think I mentioned before, the lenders and borrowers' objectives are closely aligned. But to explain that, it's not surprising since we can consider the lenders would be the majority owner over the tenure of the loan. Uh, so the LTA is a fascinating and rewarding role. And I'd like to finish on that slide and uh, hand back to Sharon, the organizer, to deal with any questions that may have come in. So thank you. Thank you, Andy, for a fantastic presentation. Uh, just mentioning quickly the housekeeping items. The presentation slides are available to download in the handout box on the GoToWebinar control panel, and you can, can continue to log your questions in the question box on the GoToWebinar control panel. I will start with the first question. What are the key concerns for lenders in large, complex pump, hydro, and hydropower projects? Thank you for the question. Um, uh, the, it, it, it's, it, I, would, I, I would say the risk management of the underground works uh, and the dam foundation works is, is a key concern. Um, as I explained, um, for these remote projects, uh, or, or even if it's not too remote um, from a city but has extremely deep um, um, underground features, it, it's likely that the degree of uh, geotech geotechnical investigation is going to be an order of magnitude smaller than um, you might expect in, in a city urban project. And therefore, uh, the concept of um, a risk sharing mechanism within the contract is, is much more important. I mean, to, to get the lenders are looking for more price certainty um, and they would want to see that there has been a fair and equitable uh, arrangement in the contracting provisions. Um, such that the, the contractors can fairly price um, for what conditions may be encountered. Um, it, it, it really is a very wide subject, but uh, I'm, 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 cho I'm choosing that theme of an answer because the webinar was really about the, the underground geotechnical risk. Thank you. The next question is about climate change. What effects have you seen in recent years for real evidence of climate change on hydropower projects? Well, um, I think the, the, the assessment of the hydrological uh, um, return period of, of floods has, has been real. In the last 10 years in three different countries, um, in Africa and Asia, <clears throat> well, and indeed Australia, so there, there's, there's many examples, we've seen significantly um, more intense uh, rainfalls, leading to more intense flooding. And in the case of some countries where the long-term statistical records are for, 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 for river flows are not available, it's referred to as the flood of record. <clears throat> you know, the um, from observations of where that flood may have caused erosion on riverbanks in the past, you know, decades or 50 or 100 years, it's, it's very unlikely you go much past 50, 60, 70 years if you're, if you're trying to get information from um, households that, that, that may have been around then. Uh, but 
significant amount of much more I would say short 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 bursts of intensive rainfall causing um, localized landslide problems and short shorter duration but more intense river flow floods um, um, seems uh, which have um, which are beyond the um, hydrological assessments that, that we've typically seen over the last 10 20 years thank you the next question is about the GBR. How is a geotechnical baseline report pre perceived in the context of managing geotechnical on, or contractual risk? Well, I think that the GBR, the geotechnical baseline report, um, is a good tool for um, large hydropower projects which have a lot of underground works, uh, which, as I explained earlier, are not likely to have a significant amount of uh, deep, deep borehole data, either because it was environmentally too difficult to do or too costly or time consuming. Um, and therefore, um, a sensible approach uh, in, in connection with various con contractual models that allow the GBR to be implemented, um, it does make um, sense for some sensible risk sharing between the owner and, and the contractors, at least the GBR for the remote hydro project sets sets a baseline uh, um, below or above which both parties know um, that baseline and what the contractual um, and how and how the costs and time can be contractually adjusted depending on what um, what is encountered uh, as tunneling commences. Thank you. The next question is about PS, PSP, actually, if you can also clarify what it is. Uh, how does the PS, PSP, as in Australia, most HEP are like? Have any different LTA responsibility or are they equivalent to any usual run of the river project? Okay, uh, I'm assuming PSP means pump storage plant. Um, it could be a terminology there. Uh, well, I, I would say that it's um, fairly similar. Uh, I, 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 except on the probably on the social side, on the ENS, the environmental and social element of the LTA work. Uh, by the way, I should explain that the common term lenders technical advisor also includes significant significant amount of E and S environmental and social um, uh, checking on behalf of the lenders. Um, it's unlikely that in Australia, for example, you would have uh, large scale or any uh, resettlement um, of of, of villages, that's simply not going to happen in, in Australia. In many developing countries, that still is the case, but they need to be properly safeguarded. And there's various uh, rules and regulations that different lenders would use. It could be the World Bank or the Asian Development Bank or, or the IFC performance standards. They will all have different directives as to what is best practice for dealing with the social items. But I think at the heart of it, the whether it's called the independent certifier or the lender's independent engineer or whatever the actual term of the role is, it's primarily acting on behalf of the lenders. Um, and the role typically does start in due diligence. It goes to the bankability phase. It continues through construction. And then in many cases, it continues through operation as well, although it may fade out after two or three years. Thank you. I will take the last question. Uh, this is something that you touched on during the presentation. If you can elaborate more on the topic of how much geotechnical investigation is enough. <laughs> right, yes. Well, I think I deliberately um, um, didn't try to give an answer because it, you could probably argue that there's never enough. But, but, but I think the main point here is that it needs to be, you know, it, it's significantly, it's an order of magnitude less typically in your very large hydro scheme um, compared to the urban transport tunnel. So the, so the uncertainty is much higher. Um, I, I, I really think the that a risk sharing model, um, for, at least for the underground elements, you know, if you have a large hydro scheme, um, you might have 25% of the value for dams, 25% for tunnels, 20% for turbines, 10% for transmission. You know, there's many, many very expensive high value elements to a, to a big hydro scheme, uh, but they don't all have the high uncertainty. It's really just mainly the underground. So you could um, have a risk apportionment uh, model in the contract that just deals with where the higher uncertainty is. I mean, you could interchange the word risk with uncertainty, 
is that's really what it is. Um, in many, many cases, it's it's still perfectly achievable to get through those tunnels. You just don't know at what 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 precise ground conditions will be encountered at what point. Fantastic. Thank you, Andy. Um, thank you for all your questions today and thank you, Andy, for a fantastic presentation. All additional questions will be answered directly by Andy later in the next few days. So um, you can still feel, feel free to reach out to Andy via the contact details shown on the screen and we hope to see you in our upcoming uh, webinar sessions. So thanks again, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Bye.